Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I am your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at the streets of LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this intersection and for joining us on this episode. If you are watching on the video version, as always, we invite you to participate in our live chat. Uh, we have one here on Facebook and also on YouTube. So feel free to comment, um, share your thoughts and feelings about this episode, but most importantly, we do want you to share this episode. By sharing it on social media, even making a comment helps it become more visible to your social media following. And also to those of you who are listening on an audio version of the podcast through one of our audio podcast players like Apple, uh, Google, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, and others, we invite you to su subscribe to this channel. I will give you kind of a teaser. Um, or an alert. If you are subscribed on the audio version, you will receive the episode a little bit sooner. So there's kind of a perk to getting the audio version of the podcast because you do get to hear this um, without the video first. So there you go. Uh, thank you again for joining us. We have another fabulous, fantastic, exciting, intriguing, probably tear jerking, heartbreaking, um, but happy story for you today. And I'm really excited to be able to bring um, Chris's story to the Latter Gay Stories audience to better understand this experience. Uh, if you didn't read the teaser, uh, the information ahead of this episode, this is a fascinating story. This is a story about coming out, which so many of these are, uh, but a story about um, understanding uh, and better connecting with who and what you are. Chris's story is uh, one that's familiar to so many. Growing up in a household where you know that something about you is different, but not having a language or words to better understand what that difference is uh, on coming out and transformation and helping to fulfill the measure of your creation and become exactly who uh, you are. And that is what today's episode is. And I'm excited to have you along to share in that. So. Welcome to you and welcome to uh, Chris to the Latter Gay Stories podcast. Thank you for giving us uh, a little bit of a little bit of time and some vulnerability to share your story. You bet. No, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, what in that introduction? I know that was really brief, but what in the uh, what did we miss, or what should the audience know uh, about you that we didn't give in that brief inter introduction? Well, I mean. That was a young age that, you know, I kind of explained at a very young age. Um, obviously, we, I have a lot of years, you know, past that time that I had to, to get through and to eventually to get to where I am right now. So, you know, I'm sure as we go along, we'll, we'll cover a lot of that. So a, a couple cool parts about your story. First, um, you're transgender. Mm -hmm. So for our audience who um, is just tuning in, uh, originally born female uh -huh. and um, transitioned male, and we'll get to kind of the timeline on, on how this worked. So you grew up uh, as a Latter-day Saint, um, female Latter-day Saint, trying to better understand who and what you are in a somewhat prominent um, Latter-day Saint family. Your last name is Packer. Yep. So yeah. some relation there to um, the, Uncle the great... Boyd. Uncle Boyd uncle Packer. Uncle Boyd. Yep. He was my great uncle. So, and, and in the Mormon world, for those who follow Mormon history, your dad is Lynn Packer. Uh-huh. And so Lynn has spent plenty of time uh, in the Mormon <laughs> circles. He has, and he's spent a lot of time, um, you know, kind of speaking out and, um, you know, given his background as a, a reporter and, and a journalist, he's... He's done a lot of research and investigation on his own. And, you know, I grew up, you know, kind of surrounded by that. Um, in no way did, did you know, him and, and his thoughts on Mormonism, um, he never um, put his thoughts and biases towards myself. He kind of let um, us as children kind of figure out, you know, where we felt or lied with the church and stuff like that. And that's part of the interview that I want to get to a little later on is how, I mean, you obviously 
watched general conference. Uh You went to family reunions. Mm -hmm. You heard the messaging that was coming out of the church uh, regarding uh, sexuality and gender identity. And I mean, more particularly, this is family who is, um, who are some of the most prominent voices in this space in terms of how this message is laid out. So I want to talk a little bit about that a little later in the interview, Um, but also let the audience know, uh, what do you do professionally? Where, what do you... Yeah, so I'm, I've am i been in education. This is, uh, I'm finishing up year 31. So I was a, a art teacher um, for um, 17 years and then went into administration and I've done that, you know, since uh, down in Alpine School District. So um, not only is it a story of, of uh, transformation and finding out um, who and what you are, but also a success that you're able to um, do the things that are good and, and do the things that bring you joy and benefit the community and see that there is uh, another example of, of someone who is thriving and, and making something great of their life. Yeah, no, I've really appreciated my career. Um, I love serving you know, people and especially young people. Um, you know, it's a way to give back, um, cause you know, I feel like, you know, throughout my life, you know, people have helped me along the way. Um, and I always wanted to find a career that I would be able to serve people. So, uh, I picked a really great career and it's been a really great journey. That's great. So let's start at that point. Uh, you talked about youth and, mm-hmm. and the importance of kind of that generation. Um, Let's talk about your young years. So essentially starting in the beginning, let's go all the way back to the ancient decade of the (laughs) seventies and just talk a little bit about what life was like growing up. At what point did you realize I'm different and how, um, and and essentially just familiarize the audience with what it's like to grow up in Chris's shoes. Um, well, we pretty much stayed relatively in the same er general area growing up. Um, kind of bountiful Davis County, um, grew up mainly in Farmington, um, spent a lot of time outdoors. Uh, I loved being outside. Um, you know, my main playmates were, were boys and luckily at that age, you know, they, um, you know, tend to be okay with a, a girl hanging out with them and they didn't think much of it. Cause like I said, I was pretty much a tomboy and, um, you know, dressed kind of the part. I know my mom really struggled with trying to put me in, you know, clothes that were fitting of a young lady, but um, she realized that it was a struggle, you know, for her to try to keep me in, you know, a, a little dress or, or have my hair pulled back or, or things like that. And so, um, you know, she wasn't too, too much, um, overbearing where she said, no, you will do these things. So she kind of let me, um, kind of figure out, you know, the things I like to do, who I like to play with. And so I mainly played with little boys and outside love sports, love sports a lot. Um, loved watching them, loved playing all sorts. Um, and then, you know, as, as I started getting into, you know, junior high, um, it wasn't quite as acceptable, you know, to, to be the tomboy. I think especially, you know, in that time, you know, in the, in the early eighties, um, you know, you, you were kind of, um, you didn't see the tomboy as much at when kids started getting older. Um, I know now it's a lot more acceptable if, if a young lady, even if they're not transgender to, you know, to wear what they want and to be seen more as, you know, a sporty athletic type. Um, but back then it wasn't quite like that. Um, you kind of felt like you needed to conform. Um, and that's probably where it really, I think my struggle really started beginning because, um, also the pressure of attraction and who you were, um, supposed to be attracted to. And I think, it was difficult, you know, going into that stage of my life, knowing, you know, I already knew how I felt, you know, 
at a very young age, four or five years old, I always felt like I was a little boy, you know. Um, you know, I had a girl name, and, and at that point, um, you know, your physical features aren't exhibited as much. And so, you know, I, I felt, you know, rather comfortable, but as soon as puberty and things started developing and um, then it became more of a struggle um, to where, um, you know, I wasn't really happy with what I saw or what I was expected to be and do. And I think that's when, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call myself depressed, but I think secretly I was depressed. And I think this is a good part of the interview where um, the audience just, we have to be super clear that when we, uh, most of the time when we have interviews on the Latter-day Stories podcast, we are either discussing sexual orientation or gender identity um, separate from each other. And often for the learning audience, those who are trying to better understand this space, those are easy to bulk together. Um, oh, you're transgender, so you're gay, or um, vice versa. There, there's not a great understanding in the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. Most um, audience members on the podcast and most um, queer individuals that we speak with either experience sec a difference in sexual orientation or uh, gender identity. It's, it's an either or. Your story involves both where you have to better understand your sexuality and later your, uh, your orientation, your, your gender expression or, or gender orientation. Um, so I, I just kind of want to preface that for, the, for our audience because we're going to talk on, about both sides of those experiences. So here you are, a young girl growing up, um, feeling attracted to other girls. Is that was your experience? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, like if, you know, um, in grade school, you'd have crushes at, you know, I mean, we, we have young kids and, and you know that at a very young age, there's crushes or attractions um, that are natural. They're not like, no one tells you that you need to like a particular person, but you just naturally are, are drawn to certain aspects um, in more of a, um, you know, at that age, I don't think it's necessarily sexual, but just more of an attraction, you know, where, oh, I'm attracted, you know, to the opposite gender. Um, and yeah, at a very young age, I realized, oh, you know, I'm, I'm hanging out with these girls who I'm supposed to hang out with, but oh, I'm finding that I'm attracted to them and not, I'm not attracted to, you know, young boys. And that's the world that that you're coming from, you're experiencing, you're telling us about, is this young, as early as, I think you said four or five, very young, realizing that I feel like I'm a boy in this mm -hmm. body and I have a natural affinity or attraction to girls, which has got to be so interesting. And as you get older, and maybe, I mean, this is just speculating or projecting my own experience, but as you get a little bit older, then you may start questioning um, both of those altogether is one trying to compensate for the other is one an expression of the other. And, and I'm sure we can kind of get to that, but I do want the audience just to understand that we are talking about two separate, separate experiences right. here, which I think is super beneficial for the audience to see that there is, there's a gigantic difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. Oh, definitely. Because, you know, um, cause then as you, you know, as I started into, you know, more junior high, high school, you know, I did start realizing, oh, well, there's kind of a name for at least the sexual attraction piece to it. And so, you know, but when people would say gay or lesbian or, or bisexual, it's like, well, I, okay, if that's, you know, how, because, you know, obviously at that point I'm female and if I'm attracted to a female, then I guess that makes me a lesbian. But in my mind, I was like, well, but I really think I'm a male and I'm attracted to females. So then I'm straight, I'm straight. And so it was really a conflict, you know, like you said, of two different worlds, two different things that, that are very separate. And I think that's a great point to bring up is, is that when we say 
post-transition, we look at it and say, oh no, you were gay, obviously. You transition, now you become straight. You were always straight. You were always straight. Yeah, in my mind, yeah. I didn't see, you know, you know, I guess um, that I would be different than, I guess, a, you know, the general population, you know, at that point. Makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about, I mean, obviously, I think you've set the stage well. Things weren't as easy as um, they could have been in terms of better understanding what was happening within yourself. Puberty hits, and you're now starting to see changes in your body um, and changes in your uh, attractions and experiences. What was life like then? Um, you know, I, I, it's a lot of dislike of yourself. I know, you know, I know that a lot of people struggle with features, you know, like, oh, I don't like my nose or my eye color or, you know, it went deeper than that because it wasn't just one feature you, you didn't like. It was, you know, pretty much everything about you. So that's what I think is really, really hard is that you're thinking, well, God, I, it's not possible for me to change my whole person, you know, I mean, maybe I could get a nose job if I didn't like my nose, but you know, at that point I'm, I was thinking, I, I don't know how to deal with the fact that there's not a part of me that I like. And, and you spend a lot of time, um, you know, you know, wondering how, how you're going to cope with that, you know, as, cause this is very early on and, you know, you're hopefully expecting to live a long life and you're thinking, wow, how do I, you know, cope with this, you know, for a long time. And, you know, you, you don't look in the mirror a lot, you know, that's one coping mechanism where you just don't look at yourself or at least just don't look deeply, you know, you just, um, you don't like to have pictures taken of you, you know, cause then that's a constant reminder of, of an image that you, um, really have a hard time with. Um, and so, you know, at that point, I think those were the, some of the things that I did to avoid, you know, um, I remember one experience with my mom, um, and, she, and obviously she, I haven't told her about this cause you know, I don't, I don't blame my parents for any of this and stuff. And so, um, you know, I have full respect for what they were trying to do and how, you know, they were trying to raise me and stuff. But I, I remember a time with my mom, um, and I was probably in, in, oh, probably early high school. Um, we went shopping and, you know, clothes shopping. I don't know if it was probably for school or something. And, um, you know, she was picking out a bunch of clothes and stuff that, you know, she thought, ah, oh, you, you know, you'd look good in this, or you, you know, this, this is acceptable. you look, you know, um, and I just remember just wanting to go over to the boys section to pick out my clothes. And, um, but obviously I couldn't, you know, cause again, you know, it's a little different, you know, back then as a teenager. And I remember taking this pile of clothes that was very, that I despised, you know, and going in the dressing room and just crying. Because, you know, I didn't want to put them on. Um, you know, but I knew that's what I was supposed to do. And, you know, you pick out some things. and But I remember that, you know, distinct moment just just thinking how am I gonna keep faking this I mean I was faking it I just felt like I guess the you know an actor that I was pretending to be but it wasn't just for a short play it was I was thinking oh this is for life I'm gonna have to act like I'm happy and that I'm okay and wasn't okay this is the real world look at what dysphoria looks like. It's also a real world look at what the reality is like 
for a closeted trans person or someone just trying to navigate and understand this portion of themselves. This is the reality. Yeah. It's painful. Yeah. I mean, even years and I'm, I'm older now, but I still remember. Yeah. I don't want to, I wanted to kind of save this, um, for the, the latter part of the interview, but I think maybe now is a great time to bring up, um, I, I want to touch, just talk about two quick aspects of, of this discussion. Um, politics, so much of what's happening uh, politically surrounding this topic, um, and also religion, how they both are preventing young Chris's and others out there from thriving. All right. Um, and I, again, I don't want to jump way down the road, but what, what do archaic orthodox policies in both education and, and politics and religion do to young people like this? What, what are the ramifications or downfalls or how much bandwidth are we wasting um, for our transgender youth right. by debating these ridiculous bills that continue to injure the transgender community. Right. No, I mean, um, I mean, the time that's spent on on that type of back and forth jargon and and politics, I mean, it is time wasted. You you could take that time and come up with solutions because I know it's a hard word world to navigate. You know, in you know, in the educational world. Um, when you start delving into trying to help transgender um, students, you know, through some of navigating just basic school life and, you know, especially as you get older into high school life where it gets really complicated how, you know, how to help um, that navigation because, you know, there are some things that um, can get very, um, I mean, people have very strong opinions and so and it and you want to keep the kids safe you know as i've worked with students um you know that's the biggest issue um i was fortunate to you know to be able to um you know help many students try to navigate and at least our school try to navigate some of these questions you know prior to some of these more hard lines coming down of oh no you're we're not going to help them, you know, we're not going to allow you to continue forward as, you know, an educational institution to figure out how to solve the problem. We're just going to stop it from even being a problem to be solved. And so it's hard to see the, the back and forth, you know, you get a few steps forward and then you have to take a few steps back, you know, you know, once, you know, things you feel like you, there's progress that's been made and then to have it taken, you know, a backward step. And I know, unfortunately, that's how progress happens, typically, you know, not just in the LGBTQ world, but in other marginalized groups have experienced very similar experiences of, oh, we feel like we've, we've made some progress and now we see ourselves stepping back. I th yeah, and I think um, one aspect that we, the politicians and a lot of people who debate the lives of other people uh, fail to realize is that we're not going to untransgender or ungay our student population or our sons or daughters or our children. That's that's not the reality. And if we continue to uh, put roadblocks in the way of these young people who are who they are. Uh, whose experience is unchanging in terms of, of who and what they are. Think of the loss. Mm -hmm. think, of, think of the opportunity. Think of the contributions that these young people can make to the educational world, to their circles, their friendship circles, their peers, to the community if we allow them to thrive just as they are. Imagine the possibilities. Right. No, I mean, um, I mean, it's hard to, to, to watch. I mean, I mean, these kids, 
deserve every opportunity, every door opened, every roadblock out of the way. And, um, I mean, and there's no reason why that shouldn't happen. I we mean, know, other than, you know, bias, fear. We and, know how hard this is. Yeah. We all went through school. <laughs> why make it harder? Right. Why make this harder? Right. You know, I mean, I'm grateful for the progress that has been made. I mean, I'm always one of gratitude because, I mean, I've seen, you know, my experience where it wasn't even known or talked about or even acknowledged. And now where we are now, I'm, I'm grateful for that progress, but there's a lot of work to be done, a lot. All right, let's move forward. So maybe you answered our whole section there, which is, I think we're not gonna solve this issue, that's for sure. And I, and I wish more politicians would side with um, even the, the Governor Cox approach. When you hear the stories and experiences of the transgender community, something inside of you changes, he said. And I think that's such a beautiful quote. No, and it's true. Um, you know, I know that being in education, I, I've had leaders that have um, taken my story and have wanted to, you know, um, I guess celebrate it. And, and I've presented at a lot of different, you know, conferences with educators to try, just to try to help them understand, you know, there's a person behind these things. There's an actual person and, you know, take the opportunity to get to know that person before you just start, you know, um, having misunderstandings or, or prejudices, you know, um, towards who you think they may be or, or, you know, and part of me, just, I just have a hard time understanding it all together because, um, I just don't think that way. And so, you know, but I realize I'm not naive. I know that there's those that are really embedded in their prejudice and it's going to be hard to move them. Um, but many a time it's like, um, it was interesting. I'll, I'll take another little story. Um, when I first went into administration and I was out, you know, and that's, that's a hard thing in Utah County to be, uh, um, and, you know, at that point I was out as a, you know, a lesbian, same sex, um, partner and marriage. And I had a principal um, that came to me, um, you know, one time in private, and he said, um, and we had just a conversation, and it, and it was about me as an individual and how that affected, you know, the, the view of the administration and just the school, because you know, there's a lot of fear that, oh, you've got adults that are, you know, going to start recruiting, you know, <laughs> kids or whatnot. And, and I, I asked him in private, I said, you know, what, you know, have you had a lot of, you know, f flack from having, you know, someone like me on your administration and stuff? And, and he said, you know what, I've had a few. He said, I have had a few approach and with concerns, having a principal who is um, lesbian. And um, I said, oh, you know, whatever, you know, what was your conversation like or what happened? And he said, you know what, um, he met, you know, would meet with them or, or whatnot. And he said, I told them that as soon as they met you and talked to you and got to know you, um, if they still felt that same way that they were concerned to come back and speak to me. And I said, oh, well, how many people came to talk to you? <laughs> you know, I, unbeknownst to me, I could have met several that were maybe just trying to check out who I was or, you know, how I was, you know, interacting with kids and whatnot. And he said, no one, no one's come to talk to me about their concern about you. And, you know, um, I think if people give you a chance and, and put some of this, you know, things aside and 
I mean, my identity and my sexual orientation does not define me. You know, I'm a person, I'm a human, I care about people, um, and the other, you know, really isn't of concern of how I interact with people or treat people. So it's interesting to see that people start realizing when they get to know people, they have less problem with what they thought they had a problem with. It's just them allowing themselves to get to know people, you know, for who they are. Yeah, this is the great combination between Brene Brown and Maya Angelou. Brene Brown, who said, when you're close to someone, it's hard to hate them. Yeah. And Maya Angelou, who said, when you know better, you do better. And I think those are two great principles that kind of harness that story. When we draw nearer and closer, and maybe even just bring this into what the governor of the state of Utah said, when you get to know these people who have just become policies or laws or uh, contentious debates, you realize that there's a human behind that story. And, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do with this podcast is create that human story. The, there has been way too much rhetoric uh, surrounding these two topics, the subjects of gender uh, identity and sexual orientation. But know that there are people and there are families and there are generations and opportunities behind each of these stories. And, and that's what I want to highlight. And I think you, I think you, that story is wonderful because as we do draw nearer and closer to people, if we have this tendency to love and we have this tendency to have this natural affinity um, towards good people. Right. And don't we all want that? We all want to be seen and recognized um, for exactly who we are. All right. All right, so there had to come a point where, um, I mean, we're, we're still prior to marriage, but um, high school, did you date? What was kind of, what was that world like? So let's kind of walk from dating, trying to understand um, who you're attracted to, what you do with that attraction, and then move that forward to, ultimately, there had to have been some type of coming out um, with your family members. Yeah, so... Um in high school, I did. I um, I dated, but I didn't date like lots of different people. I because I really didn't want to date. I found it was easier just maybe just to hang, you know, to date one person and have kind of a group of friends that, you know, all um, you know, kind of hung out together and stuff like that. Um, you know, crazy enough, I so. I guess kind of fast forward. So after high school, I then you know, went to BYU um, and I was writing a missionary. So I had dated someone, you know, pretty much all through high school. And then the expectation was, oh, well, when he gets home, you'll get you'll get married. And so, you know, as that was approaching, you know, kind of that expectation um, again, you know, I think things are a little bit different now as far as, you know, I don't know, maybe there's still the, the same real quick pressure of as soon as someone gets home to hurry and get married. Um, you know, but I, I do see kids, you know, people getting married a little bit later now. Um, so I think it's hopefully not quite the same. But, you know, back then it was as soon as that missionary came home, you know, that was the expectation. And and so, um, you know, I kind of knew that was, you know, it was almost like an arranged weird marriage kind of thing. Cause it's like, I knew what was expected. I knew that that was kind of the next step and it was already kind of pre-planned for me. And so I was, um, really fearful. Um, and actually, you know, the young man came home we did get married and um shortly um i mean it was it was interesting um um and actual actually elder packer um was the one that married us in the temple and so um i remember though you know you know following i got i got really sick um following that i i it was almost like I, I couldn't lie anymore. Like I, I mean, I was really ill. My my parents were, you know, quite concerned about me, um, that I had, 
you know, for the most part, I had, you know, been a very happy person, even though I was acting through a lot of it. I was, I was, you know, outgoing and happy and, and they did see a switch, um, a change of, okay, you're n now definitely not yourself. And, you know, so shortly after that, I, um, I think we were married, oh, maybe just a few months and, you know, they knew that something needed to be done. And so we started going to counseling, um, and, you know, marriage type counseling to see if, if that could, you know, but secretly I knew what the problem was. And, um, had, had you come out to your husband at all? No. Was there any discussion no. prior to the marriage? Uh -uh. So this is a typical Mormon story of yep. mission marriage. Children will fix this. If I just do all the right things, yep. this will go away. Why tarnish the marriage by bringing right. this up? Because I'm doing all the right things. Therefore right. this will no longer be the struggle. Right. Right. Well, it, and even prior to that, when I was in high school, I recall many, a night um, sitting out on our front porch, you know, begging for something to happen, you know, like begging for that change to come because I was doing everything that I was supposed to do. I was going to church. I was praying. I was, you know, a, a good member. I, you know, was faithful. I was doing all the things, all the things they tell you to do and nothing was changing. And I remember just begging. I mean, it, and you wonder why people get to the edge because when you're, when you feel like you're, you know, forsaken by God and that's how you feel like, why, you know, I'm doing everything I'm told. Why, you know, what does it take <laughs> for, you know, something to happen? Um, and you know, so I, I went through the motions trying to get things to, to be different for either me to feel different or to have the courage to, you know, just, you know, step away or, or whatnot. But anyway, so went, went through marriage counseling. Um, we, we were able to get so, and it didn't work again. I never divulged why other than I was not happy and I didn't want to be married. Um, and so we were able to get our marriage annulled. So I wasn't married for a long time. Um, you know, a lot of these things you do try to shut out of your life. I don't know, painful times you do try to kind of closet away and not think about those things just to kind of be able to keep moving forward. Um, um, and then after that, you know, annulment was the time that I said, I will never date again. I won't, I cannot lie. My, I guess my, um, desire to be a truthful person outweighed trying to do, you know, what everyone else was wanting me to do. And I think there's an added pressure here too, where you have uncle, uncle Boyd, uncle Packer, general authority, member of the quorum of the 12 who serves as the officiant in your wedding um, and family. So you have this Mormon aspect that just is weight, I mean, crushing, really. There, there's an aspect of that that you don't want to disappoint often, and I think this is familiar in Mormonism, we worry about everyone else and what everyone else thinks of us before we secure our own oxygen mask. Right. Before we take care of ourselves. And what, did you experience that? I mean, getting annulled, and I don't know how, this is actually something I've never really jumped into. I don't know how the temple divorce works in an annulment, but um, that trickles down. Obviously, your uncle finds out about this. Um, this is talking in the family as well and in the ward. How, how do you kind of mitigate that yeah. pressure? Well, definitely there was... Um you know, my, my parents, you know, even though they knew something was wrong, um, they felt like I should have stuck in it. You know, they, f I did definitely feel the pressure of, well, you haven't given this enough time. Um, 
you know, marriage is hard anyway, you know, it's an adjustment, you know, things like that. And so I didn't have the support of my, you know, my parents. They were a little bit angry with me. Um, I think if, I mean, I think at this time was probably the lowest time I've experienced as far as, you know, the disappointment of my parents, um, obviously the disappointment of his family and, and, you know, and, you know, the expectation and, um, the embarrassment and, you know, all the things that go along with something like that, especially cause I never disclosed why I, you know, I guess it, it could have maybe been more insightful for them to know maybe how I felt, um, inside, but I feared, I feared to, you know, say, how I felt, you know, cause I thought, God, if they're reacting this way towards, you know, maybe a marriage, you know, not working out or whatnot, how are they going to feel when I tell them, you know, how I really feel? Um, I think it's a really great point too. And maybe the thing that we aren't talking about either is there's fear in this discussion, but there's also failure when we, try to do everything that we know um, and it doesn't work anymore. When uh, we read our scriptures, when we pray, when we fast, when we attend the temple, when we do everything Mormonism tells us uh, will get rid of this or help us. And when it doesn't, that's, that's an added part of this element that we don't talk a lot about. But it also adds to this baggage and it adds to the pain of this whole discussion where, um, I mean, it's one thing to worry about the needs of other people. It's also another to feel like a failure every day, knowing that, look, I'm reading my scriptures, I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm going to the temple, I'm doing everything you're asking me to do and I'm not changing and this is not going away. And now, in we have very familiar stories. I, I was married as well. Now uh, we are creating collateral damage other people in our circle are being impacted by my right. failure and that's crushing when really we didn't fail at all. Right. No, I, and that's why I said following that, I said, I will never date because to me, it's not fair, you know, to, to be dishonest, um, and, and bring someone else in, into it that really, um, you know, they didn't know or didn't understand and, and to, to have that weight you carry almost for them too, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that it, it was, sh you know, short lived, um, you know, but I'm sure, you know, it, it has ripple effects of how it then affects, you know, different families and, and people close to you. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. It's really hard to, I don't know, completely understand, um, you know, why this is happening. You know, I mean, truly, it, it baffles me sometimes. Fortunately, you're in <laughs> space where people, you don't have, we, we get it. Like, we, we can understand because this is such a familiar story to so many of us. Um, and I also think this is probably part of the story that also is familiar in terms of the springboard nature. You have been able to undo successfully um, this portion of your story. So does it springboard you? Does it give you some motivation to start becoming more authentic, to start looking at what authenticity looks like? Um, does it give you some energy to better understand what it's going to take? Yeah. So, so definitely when I kind of said, well, I'm, I'm not going to date anymore. Um, and then, you know, at that point I thought, well, I'll just go through life single, you know, I'll just try to, you know, have a career and try to be happy, um, in a single life. Because at that point I, didn't think, oh, well, maybe I should pursue these feelings that I have. And because again, I was still very involved in the church and, and I knew, well, that's my next option. If I'm not going to get married, then I'll just stay single um, and not act upon, you know, things. By feelings, and I, I don't want to really interrupt you, but 
by feelings, are you saying gender identity or sexual orientation? Well, as far as, you know, again, at the, as far as the identity piece, again, at that phase, I mean, cause this is kind of now the early nineties, again, there wasn't much, you know, I didn't see a lot out there as far as, oh, I've got the possibility that I could reassign my, you know, that in my head didn't, didn't trans, you know, I, I felt like, yeah, I'm going to have to kind of, you know, fake both worlds and just move forward singly. I mean, at the time that, um, I, you know, got annulled and was moving on. I mean, I, I do, and I was out of the home. And so I felt like I could be more like me, more authentic to me. You know, that's when I kind of started dressing a little bit different, more, you know, more, um, you know, not feminine. Um, I wouldn't say extremely masculine, but you know, there was more of a neutral world that I was navigating to where I could feel at least comfortable in my skin a little bit. Um, and so that, that kind of helped a little bit of that area. And then again, I wasn't planning on, on dating or, or marriage or anything like that. And so I was just kind of, you no, know, it's, it's, it's the craziest thing. I think, you know, when, when I, you know, back in high school, when I was about, le you know, to leave high school and go out on my own, when I would pray to be changed, I think what was delivered was a, a hope that if I hang in, I don't know all the answers, you know, but if I can hang in there and I, I do the things that I can to, to move forward, something's going to happen. You know, I had this belief that, you know, even though, you know, at that point I didn't believe that I was going to change how I felt or who I was, I did believe in some hope that if I hung on long enough that something was going to change for me. And I don't know where that came from other than it, that's how I felt. Um, and so really that's what kept me, I think, moving forward through life to see what would happen next. And what happened next? Well, so some, um, some remarkable experience. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're, you know, so, you know, I'm well into my career and, um, and I know eventually we're going to get to the story of, you know, me and my wife and, and our, our meeting and stuff. And I don't know how much you want to go into that as I travel onward, but, you know, eventually, you know, I did start to think, you know, what? I, I want a family. I want kids. I, I've always wanted them. I thought, oh, I don't necessarily want to count that out, you know? And so, you know, there's times I thought, well, maybe I could adopt, maybe I could, you know, do something to have that, that piece of my life. Um, and then, you know, I think a lot of it is how society started changing and start more information came to me of, well, there's people out there in same sex relationships and, and it was more visible. It was like before I couldn't see anything in front of me. And, and now it's like, I can see things. I can see that there's possibility of stuff. And it's like, why shouldn't I maybe look at something like that? Um, and then to step back. So, so right around in this time frame is, you know, so my, my, um, religious part and my, I guess my life part kind of, um, it wasn't like, oh, okay, I'm going to start dating and, and then that caused a conflict in my religious part. It wasn't like that. I, I got to a point, I'm, I'm kind of a intellectual kind of person and, um, and I kept thinking, you know, what do I really think about my church? I devote a lot of time and a lot of my self to it. And 
And I've just relied on a lot of people telling me what I should do and not do and how I should think and feel. And, and I, I wanted to know, like, the church that I've been involved in, is it something I truly believe? Because, you know, now I'm out of high school, I'm out of college, um, you know, and I went to BYU, so I was very ingrained in, in, in religion, you know, throughout that experience. And I finally got to a point of, what do I believe? I've been writing the coattails of a lot of people who, f who seemed to know what they believed, but I didn't know what I truly believed. And so I did, at that point, kind of reach out to my dad, and I said, Dad, I, you know, I know your thoughts and feelings on things. And I said, I'm, I'm at a point where I really want to know what I do believe. Because I can't get up in church and, and bear a testimony of, I'm, again, very honest person. So I never bore my testimony. I never got up and said anything because I didn't know what I believed. And so um, he gave me some really good advice. He said, you know what, there's a lot of literature out there, you know, a lot of information that you can get to. And this is even before a lot of things, you know, a lot of, you know, things were on the web that you could go and search. So a lot of the things I had to look at were books. And so he said, you know, look at books that are both kind of pro you know, written in more of a pro-church approach and those that are, you know, more, I guess, anti and just kind of read both pieces and try to figure out how you feel about the history of the church and, you know, how, how it was developed and, and things like that. And so I took a good, oh, couple years and really dug in and see now there's so much information out there. I mean, again, different time where I didn't have as much out there that I could read people's experiences and people, you know, people's thoughts and, and things like that. I just had to base it a lot off of historical things and just writings. And, and I kind of came up with the conclusion myself, Un, you know, unrelated to who I was and how the church felt about me. I wanted to put that part aside. I didn't want that bias. I wanted to know how I felt, you know, towards, and I came up, you know, with my own conclusions as to, you know, the, the church. It's interesting. I was just thinking, mirroring my own experience as you were speaking and the anti-Mormon literature, the, the anti messaging that ended up becoming the gospel topic topic essays um those all those things that we were uh, trained to fear uh, both not only just historically as things that we should fear and not look into um but also s sexually uh, the things that were spoken of uh, about lgbtq people um how those carved so many journeys for each of us i i do i i really appreciate the point, and, and I hope the audience picked up on that, that we have to find out how we feel. Right. Um, less about what society is telling us is the right answer, less about um, if you pray this goes away, if you just do all the things this fixes itself, but more about this is Abraham learning something about Abraham. This is Chris learning something about Chris, Kyle learning something about Kyle, and how much of that is us and connected there. And that's a great lesson. Yeah, definitely. I think everyone needs to take their their own journey. And and as we again talk as a couple about, you know, our our journey and stuff, um, everyone needs their own, you know, it, it shouldn't be influenced. It shouldn't be um, you know, just forced upon us, you, you need to figure out things, you know, kind of for yourself as to how you feel about your spirituality and, and, you know, how you want to move forward and, you know, and, and eventually maybe, you know, raising your kids and things like that. You, you want to make sure that you have a good understanding of how you feel about things. So spoiler alert, um, 
you realized everything you had been taught um, had a different facet. There were multiple multiple facets to this Mormon diamond. Um, where did that research, where did that personal uh, reflection lead you? Well, I, I really struggle with um, church history. I really struggle with um, how the church was formed and why it was formed. And, um, you know, I, I really, um, you know, because it's the formation that then brings forth the doctrine. You know, how, why, how, um, who. And so by diving into that, you know, then you can have your thoughts on doctrine that then comes forth from that entity, you know, forming and, and, you know, having what, you know, what they believe or, or how they want to um, instruct people how to think and, and believe. And so, um, so, uh, you know, at that point, um, I knew that I, I didn't have a testimony of the church. I, I didn't believe in you know the the things that were taught and and how everything was formed and 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 that's it's hard because you know I there's things I do appreciate about my upbringing you know um, in a religious setting um, and so it's a hard conflict to take what you valued about your religious experience and then now what you do believe about it. And, the, and there's that struggle of, that internal struggle of, well, I, I know this about how I feel, but you know these are the things I've grown up thinking and believing, and, and it is a part of me. I'm, you know, I, I try not to have any regrets about you know, life and, and the journey through it, because all these experiences make us who we are. You know, would I be a different person if I wasn't, you know, brought up, uh, you know, in the church or in my, in that background, you know, who knows, but you know, you, you add it to your collection of things that you become you and you try to pick out the good things that you gained. And then you try to, um, I guess, um, work through the things that maybe were very harmful about your experience. Um, Cause I try to be very optimistic. I do try to pick out, you know, I gained certain things that, that I value as a person, you know, through my experience growing up. Um, but you know, there's a good portion that, that um, I've had to kind of resolve and, and let go. Makes sense. And, and I think there's probably, there had to have been an added element to that too in your particular situation that was even um, more complex, and that is that you're a Packer. Yeah. And it, you had a lot of that influence weighing yeah. not only just the Boyd K. Packer world, the blood of Lynn Packer flows through your veins. Yeah. So yeah. the investigative part of me. Yeah, no, and what was great about my dad is he did not tell me what he f- thought and felt he he wanted me to discover it on my you know he wasn't you know saying anything negative or pro or against i mean he said this is your journey to figure out he says i can lead you to some you know things to read or to research but this is yours to f- to come up with a conclusion that's best for you and and so you know it's you know, you know, kind of going forward with, you know, some of the things that the, that, you know, even Uncle Boyd, um, there were some things that, that were very hard to hear, um, you know, because at, at a certain point, my parents knew, and we'll, we'll again talk about how I, I came out to my, my family and stuff, but, you know, once my parents did know, and, um, and some of the doctrine that came out about LGBTQ, I mean, this is even prior to me, um, you know, them knowing I was trans as well. Um, 
th- that some of it was really hard for them, you know, because they my parents were very supportive um, of of you know each each step that I've now taken and and they had a lot of you know hard you know f- they were finding it very difficult when they would hear certain doctrine coming forth that that um, was harmful towards me and others you know um, you know like me um, and they were very defensive I know my dad he 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 I think reached out to you know my my uncle he never disclosed what he said to him um, but he he did tell me he said you know because he could tell I was hurt by some of the things that were coming out you know at that point you know I wasn't going to church but you're I mean I'm surrounded by people that are still in the church and you know obviously you get word and unfortunately social media helps expand the word of what goes on at conference or whatnot and and so I mean some very harmful you know things have come out and and even more so now with the trans community there's a lot coming out um and he did he mentioned that he did reach out um to his uncle and and you know mentioned that he had a you know a daughter at that point um and but again he didn't let me know what it contained i know it was probably you know something of uh, hurt as well for the non latter day saint audience who listens to this episode and maybe this is a good refresher for our latter day saint uh, audience as well historically and a lot of what chris is talking about uh can be found in on the record where it kind of detailed a lot of this messaging that had come out of the church at this time concerning sexual orientation and gender identity but specific to boyd k packer elder packer um so much focus on gender roles that there was a certain set of standards for women and a certain set of standards for men um one of his most famous or infamous talks was the two young men only talk um where he uh specifically talks about gender identity sexual orientation the role of men uh, in holding the priesthood women are uh, nurturers um, homemakers they are to support the husband um, that talk also talks about the little factory um, where masturbation eventually through what he also yielded from Spencer Kimball, that masturbation was a cause of, of homosexuality um, to avoid that at all costs in order to avoid homosexuality. Uh, there were multiple manuals that were written um, under that tutelage of that chain of apostles, um, encouraging mixed orientation marriages, uh, denying lesbianism, denying homosexuality. I mean, just a, a wide variety of messaging that's taken place in Mormonism at this time. Um, so, A, that's commendable to Lynn Packer for reaching out to uh, Elder Packer on your behalf. And, in, on, and I don't get the sense um, that it was just on your behalf, but on behalf of the LGBTQ community, on behalf of uh, more people who were familiar with this topic more than just Boyd and more than just those other apostles that, again, kind of what we started this discussion with, that there are real people behind um, right. these policies and real people behind this discussion and drawing closer to a uh, better understanding their experiences. And unfortunately, we know that also doesn't influence everyone. We know Dallin H. Oaks has a gay grandson um, and that hasn't influenced well, maybe I should say if it has influenced him, I would hate to see what Mormonism would look like had Elder Oaks not been influenced by his gray gran- gay grandson's experience because it's already hostile for the LGBTQ community. But to the point, um, when we know better, we do better. And when we get to draw closer to each of those individual experiences, we become better people, I think. Um, experience has shown that. And so. I, I get what you're saying. It's difficult. It, it's a difficult world to bridge um, because so much of, and maybe this is one last tangent, I promise, <laughs> but so much of Mormonism um, hinges around doing what is right and letting the consequences follow. But hiding who and what we are is not doing what's right. 
And when we talk about honesty and authenticity, how can we be honest and authentic and hide who we are? Right. I mean, your story has been evidence of that so far, that continuing to hide and continuing to shut away and praying that something else will change or hoping that some policy will r cause some reaction that makes something different isn't the strategy. It isn't what works. Um, but what about living to the fullest measure of, of our creation? What happens if that actually is what works? I mean, where would we be as a society, as a religion, if that was the position that we operated off of? Okay, so that was hypothetical. <laughs> All right, so you do begin um, to unravel this and start living, and I will say this with pride, with a self-centered nature. You finally start being self-centered. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because I'm, I'm not that way naturally. I try to think of others before myself and um and so i think yeah it's the self discovery of really how i felt about you know you know my religion or my, you know i i like to call it spirituality um because that to me it makes more sense to me um cuz i do feel like i'm a very spiritual person that that there's things around me that that i appreciate and you know and, and I'm not so worried about answers, you know, anymore, because I realize that, you know, you're not going to get all the answers. I mean, none of us know what exactly is going to happen once we leave, you know, the earth and, and things like that. But um, obviously something great has created each of us and, and, you know, the planet we live on. And so, you know, I think I spend more of my time um, appreciating relationships and appreciating and being grateful for the things that we have and we're able to do. And, and so I think it started shifting to more something like that. Once I kind of let go of what maybe was holding me back from really experiencing how I felt about the world and those around us and, and connecting with people and understanding people better. Um, so, you know, so following that, obviously, I started looking about, you know, why, now I started asking the question, why not, you know, instead of uh, I shouldn't, you know, it's like, well, why not now start looking at some happiness and the things that I w wanted in life, um, you know, like a partner to experience life with and uh, also kids um, to be able to see things through their eyes. I mean, there's something amazing about having kids. Um, I mean, I've spent a career around kids, but, you know, primarily teenagers. So to be able to experience, you know, young kids and to see how they view everything, you know, is, has been an, a really great experience. Um, and so I s thought, well, why not start um, looking at the possibility of, of dating and finding someone? But I, I'm kind of shy. I, I didn't know quite how to, you know, and this is before you had all the, all the dating apps and all the dating, you know, to be able to go, okay, well, let, I'll just hop on a site and see if I can, you know, see someone that, you know, that, and, and especially when the sites first came up, they were very, you know, same sex, you know, or, or, you know, super binary. Yeah. Where you're, you know, you're going to not, um, sorry that they're, that you're dating tradition. I, I hate the word traditional. So buying it. Yeah. So, um, and so I didn't pursue any sort of web, you know, any, um, social media or anything like that to look for dating. And I just thought, well, I'll just see what comes to me. Um, 
And again, when we get to our, our piece of the story, we'll, we'll talk about that conversation of how, how we met and, and our relationship. Um, and so, you know, if, if this is, you know, mainly kind of my journey, I guess we can kind of skip forward to, okay, now I, I do meet that someone. I, and we had quite the experience, you know, ourselves trying to, to maneuver life and, and how we were going to, um, you know, have, you know, be married and have kids and things like that. Um, and I was, and I'm happy. I was happy at that moment. I mean, we've been now married just over 10 years, um, but we've known each other a lot longer. Um, and I've been really happy. Um, but there was always something missing. There was always something still bothering me and in, and I knew I wasn't quite there. And I think um, to bring our audience up to speed, here, here you were this whole time um, in your youth, knowing something about you is different, um, knowing that you possibly um, were lesbian, had an attraction to women, um, not discussing uh, gender identity at all or uh, being transgender doing everything possible to stay Mormon and have that connection, not only spiritual connection, traditional and community connection and family connection as well. Um, you start analyzing your faith, analyzing your beliefs, uh, better understanding who and what you are in, in terms of the person. Um, at some point you had to also come out to your family. We keep skipping over the yeah. ultimate coming out. <laughs> um, and but I and this is a I, the audience has been forewarned. This is a multiple multiple part interview, so right. um, uh, we'll have the the great coupleation, the <laughs> the part of the story that uh, involves it's the relationship. The, it's the better part, <laughs> my I best know, part. Who got the who got the better end of the the deal? I'm not sure yet. Um, <laughs> but part of that journey, um, and maybe to my point, part of that journey does involve you. Um, publicly owning um, to the best of your knowledge who you are. Um, did that happen at the same time as your faith transition in the middle of that transition? And how was that received? Well, and, and that's why it's part, it, it, you know, I don't want to give away part of our, our story because that's where it becomes very <laughs> quite uh, interesting and almost, I, I wouldn't say comical, <laughs> but um, so I was a lot older. So all, all this time, my parents just, you know, you know, talking to them now, they, they had an idea, um, especially after getting, you know, my marriage annulled, they had a pretty good, but they didn't dare say anything to me. They were almost, they, and I asked them, you know, why, why didn't you maybe ask or you're, you're pretty certain they thought you were gay. Is yes. that what you're saying? Yes. As far as that piece of me. Yeah. Um, and so they said, well, you know, we were fearful that if you weren't, you know, maybe you just, you know, just didn't want to be married or, um, or whatnot, that that could cause some harm to you. You know, they felt like it was me that should go to them, but me being fearful of, what they would think, you know, caused this, this divide of, okay, no one's saying anything. And, and I come from a very private family. We don't talk about emotions and, you know, we're close, but we're not close. Like some families can talk about everything and anything to any member of their family. And I did not grow up that way. It was very, you know, um, very reserved and we didn't talk about feelings and things like that. Um, and so I never felt ever an, uh, an opening to let them into the, my world, I guess. Um, and so I did not, um, let them know. Actually, my wife let them know that, that, uh, w that, uh, we were in a, in a lesbian relationship at the time. And we'll get to that part. You know, I'm just giving you a teaser because we'll get to the, to that part of the story when we talk, but, um, she outed me <laughs> as crazy as that is. 
um, rather, well, at least to my parents, I actually got to, I actually got to, um, so it's, it's really quite cute. Um, I have one sister who's a little bit younger than me. Um, and we, we joke now because she's very feminine and we kind of joke that she sucked all the femininity out of me and she got a double dose because she's really, you know, the girly girl, the, you know, the cheerleader, the dancer, the, you know, um, you know, everything about her, you know, kind of screams woman, you know? And so, um, I did get to actually, you know, tell my sister, um, and crazy enough, that was the first person I, I, you know, told, um, as far as my family and stuff. So I, I called her on the phone, um, and I was crying and she was concerned. She's like, you know, what's wrong? And, you know, in her mind and, oh, and I said, ah, I got something to tell you, but I don't know how to do it. You know? And she said, and she, in her mind, she's like, are you sick? Are you dying? You know, she, cause I was crying. Um, you know, she's like, are you okay? Are you, are you healthy? Is there, you know, she thought maybe my health or there was a tragedy or something. And I said, no, I said, there's something that I've needed to tell you for a long time. And, you know, she just kind of sat there and I said, I just don't know how to say it or verbalize it. And there's long pauses and she finally said, and we can be kind of comical back and forth. And I think she was trying to, to kind of make me feel better. And she said, well, is it because you like girls? And I said, yeah. And and, and she said, you know, I've, I've known for a long time that that was probably the case that, um, you felt that way. Um, and she said, I, you know, even, even my little nephews at the time, um, would say, uh, you know, they would refer to me almost as a male, you know? And so, and, and so she didn't really say like, okay, you're, tr you know, as transgender, but she, they, she knew that there was, that I, you know, was attract, you know, that there was the likelihood I was attracted to women. And, um, and, you know, she was really great. I said, I said, towards the end of the conversation, I said, well, I, I know this is probably something, you know, that, that I've, you know, was kind of called to kind of just, you know, this was a, a challenge that I, that was, you know, given to me in a sense to kind of work through, through life and, and my sister put a different spin on it, you know, because I said, oh, I guess this is just kind of my thing I've got to get through, through, you know, my challenge through life. You know, everyone has different challenges, whether it be physical or mental, you know. And I said, I guess just, you know, working through this through life has just been kind of, and she said, no, you've got it wrong. It, she says, what it is, is it's our challenge. of how we react to you. Sorry, I told you the testosterone didn't fix this part of me. Um, and she said, you're who you are. It's our challenge to, to be able to love and, ex you know, care for you and understand you and, and I thought, oh, that's really a great comforting thought that there's nothing wrong with, with me. But it's the world that has to understand and it's their challenge to deal with each and every one of us that are maybe a little bit different than, you know, you know, what 
I guess what um, the world sees as the norm. So, so I did get to, I guess, express that to my sister. Um, but again, they didn't know about the transgender piece at that point. So, and that is the point of the story that we're going to get to on our next interview, how this chain of events unfolds, um, and the outing, which I'm excited to get to, um, <laughs> yeah. because talk about multifaceted, talk about multiple parts of this story. Uh, that's another fascinating one. Uh, Chris, thank you. Yeah. Sorry about all the tears. It zero apologies. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a lot of years to hold lots inside. Um, this is often the part of the interview where obviously this is a, uh, multiple part interview where, um, we have your wife, uh, your story and the couple's interview. Uh, but often it, as we wrap, um, these, each, each of these individual episodes, I always want to kind of focus on the future, focus on the good parts of the story. Was this worth it? Was all of the pain, was the dissonance, was the trouble? At the end of the day, was it worth it? I know you brought up in the middle of the interview um, that there was such a profound experience when you realized that you weren't broken, that there was nothing wrong with you. And that part really meant something to me. And I think it relates to so much of the audience. Um, regardless of, of the pain and the difficult parts of the journey, um, to someone who's listening, listening to this, who is contemplating whether or not it's worth coming out, whether or not it's best to tell the world. Um, and I like the part where you said, I hadn't invited them in yet, because I like that phrase, I use that often. Not come out, but not yet let the whole world in to get to know them better. Was this worth it? Was the pain, the agony, the dissonance worth it? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, I look at the journey and the timing, I mean, you know, regardless of how you feel about faith and, and you know, um, religion and things like that. But, I mean, I've always believed that I'm, you know, that um, there's a meaning behind the journey that, that you, you know, you don't need to have all the answers and, and things like that, that, that you should live each day and, and see how you can you know, be better the next day. But if I, I thought, you know, if I wouldn't have experienced what I've experienced, would I have found my wife? You know? Because, you know, I could have met someone else along the way earlier if, if the journey was a little different. And I value that and my kids more than anything. So it was worth it. Definitely. Yeah, it was worth it. Definitely. Chris, thank you. Um, as promised, we have the couples interview um, coming up. So it is our next episode, uh, episode 159. So if you're following along and we're going to hear kind of the Paul Harvey version. This will be the rest of the story <laughs> um, to uh, Kay and Chris's um, incredible story and incredible uh, journey, each with just individual parts of the story that's super profound and powerful. Any last, uh, anything we haven't talked about that we want to wrap up in your own personal story? Uh, I, I think that covers it up until, yeah, we talk about our life together and and what that has you know evolved to and all the things of that and yeah I definitely um think that the future is is going to be amazing so I'm ready I'm <laughs> I'm excited for the future thank you for giving us an hour of your time thank you for um 
staying with us through those who have been watching on the video version and making your comments um, below. Uh, thank you for participating in the conversation and for those who are listening on the audio version for subscribing to this channel and following along. We also invite you to make a um, take the opportunity to rate this podcast wherever you're listening on the audio versions. By rating the podcast, it does help us to expand our reach. Um, and the conversations that we make either on social media through the video version and the audio version helps us to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. So I, I want to thank you for um, supporting the podcast that way. That's often uh, the two questions we get is, when are the, when's the next episode coming out and how do we help the podcast? And honestly, uh, supporting the podcast via sharing, liking, subscribing, and um, just participating via social media does wonders for reach and helping us to spread this message. Uh, the second way is also financially supporting the podcast to help us build uh, these bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community and by helping us to produce episodes just like this. If you do want to make a financial donation to the podcast, we invite you to do that by logging on to our website at LatterGayStories.org and clicking on the Donate tab. And we're also Venmo friendly at Latter Gay Stories. As Chris did tease, we do have another episode coming up, episode 159, where we continue the Packer story. Um, and the the whole, uh, I don't want to call it saga, but it's kind of saga, the saga mm -hmm. behind uh, their two experiences uh, with this excellent family. So thank you for giving us an hour of your time. And we're back with another episode coming up uh, right here uh, on this podcast, where you can catch this one and, and many others on our video and audio versions. His stories just like Chris's and yours that help us each continue writing our own latter gay story.